Hi guys, if you're new here, my name is Andrea. I make commentary and lifestyle videos. Today's video is just gonna be a review of Riverdale's actress's book called Swimming Lessons by Lily Reinhardt, who plays Betty in Riverdale. Riverdale is kind of a shit show, but I think everybody enjoys watching it more or less because it's like looking at a car crash, like a deer in the headlights. It's like, it's so stupid, but also so entertaining. So that's what I expected the book to be like and I think it kind of exceeded my expectations because I didn't have any to begin with but some of the poems were bad, some of them were good so it's gonna be like a no bullshit real review. I am not a published writer. However, I have written articles for magazines, I have written poetry for magazines, so in that regard I am published but not with my own book. And I have studied um, professional script writing in my university degree, so I do have a background in that. I've practically been writing since I knew how to. And because of that I feel like I am in a position to review this. So the book itself is very soft feminine, the cover looks really nice. It's got a drawing in the style that has been very, very commercialized by people like Ruby Kaur, who is, I think, a big inspiration for this kind of modern poetry books. So the back is similar, like pastel pink. Here's the thing with Ruby. Her poetry is enjoyable and entertaining, but if you look at it from an ob objective standpoint, it's bad. And I'm saying this to somebody who has both of her books, and I have enjoyed them. But this is not what you look for in good quality poetry. If you want quality poetry, you can read books such as this, which are a lot more elaborate. The poems are longer. The choice of the words is a lot more sophisticated, a lot more metaphors and just a lot more intelligent vocabulary compared to modern poetry, which sometimes can feel like a Tumblr post or a tweet. And that is my main criticism of some poems in her book. They sound like tweets or Tumblr posts. If this happened, if I saw something like this on my Tumblr days back in 2010, I would reblog it. But for a poetry book that is of actual quality, that is not what I would expect. But that being said, I enjoyed reading it. I've read it in a few hours, like in the same day, because I liked it. I didn't want to put it down. So in that regard, she's one, I would say. From the get-go, in the layout of the book, there is something that I do not like and I'm gonna show it to you briefly. There are a lot of empty pages. I like that she put some red pages to balance it out between the white and the red. But for me, to see somebody who wastes so much paper in this world of us that we focus on sustainability and reducing consumerism, somebody who does this, I don't like it. Some of the pages have um, drawings, like, I'm gonna show you a few of them. Like, this is a drawing, obviously. Some of them are empty, some of them have drawings, which is a good balance, but at the same time, it's very, very wasteful. And I think the main reason why she did that is because some of her poems expand throughout, like, three or four pages, and I think she wanted to separate the poems that were only one page long, which makes sense, but there are other ways to do that. So at the end of every single poem, she puts her kind of like signature at the bottom, like it says LR, so like her initials. And you could put that at the start of the poem to mark the start if you wanted to separate them better. Or I think this signature at the end already kind of serves as something that separates it so i don't understand the need of all the empty pages it's just like wasteful i did not like that but i do like the um, combination between the little sketches and drawings and the poetry that is the main thing that people actually criticize modern poets like rupi Kaur for but i actually like it i like the 
aspect of it that makes it feel like a graphic novel. It makes you feel more involved because you can actually picture what the person was thinking when they wrote it and I do like it. And it actually can save bad poetry from being bad. So a lot of Rupi Kaur's poems as a standalone, I did not like them, but with the drawing attached, I liked them more. And I've seen a lot of reviews on Gabi Hanna's books being bad. And actually, I think the graphics are saving the book from being even worse. Like the second one, Dandelion, I was watching the review, and there was a drawing with two people on a boat, and or like when, on different boats, and there were like the waves crashing, and the um, poem was like really, really bad. But because of that imagery attached to it, it made it not that cringeworthy. So I feel like that is actually really good if you think you're not like a good writer in terms of just having very, very developed vocabulary. I think that is a good way of doing it. In uh, the beginning of the book, she has like an intro in which she talks to the reader and she explains how she started to love poetry because she felt like she could relate to what was being written and that because of that, she hopes that people relate to her poems. And I think if that is what she was going for, if relatability is the main point of this, then she actually succeeded because it is very relatable. It's very, very basic, but it's experiences that all of us have had. So I do feel like she has accomplished her goal that she set off to do. The interaction poem, I'm gonna read it to you. I think it's very weak for a first impression. And that is one of the things that I when I started reading the book, it made me kind of like brace for what was to come because it wasn't a good starting point for that. I think she could have begun with other poems. She started the book with, I can't seem to write perfect words or make them flow as they should. They don't sound particularly profound. I can't paint you pretty pictures or blend colors like other artists do. My watercolors don't bleed beautifully. But I can say I love you in as many languages as you need me to. I can be fluent in loving you. So this is not that bad but for an opening of a book I think it is really weak but I do appreciate the self-awareness of her saying that she doesn't sound profound like other poets and she doesn't need to you know there is an audience for this not everybody likes classical poetry and that's valid and the artistry of people I'm not here to gatekeep it because I do consider myself an artist but I'm not particularly talented in like drawing or even photography I like doing it but I don't consider myself that talented in it and that ex that much of an ex expert in it. But because I love it, I wouldn't gatekeep it from someone like her to identify as an artist. That's fine. You can do that. This is not what the criticism is about. It's just about how this poem should have been later in the book, in my opinion, and something else should have been a placeholder of an opening poem. Something that is stronger, something that hits harder. And I have found a few ones that are really, really good and I would have put them first personally, if I could choose this. After the interaction poem, you get a glimpse of her feelings for a family member that passed away, who I assume is her grandma, because it sounds like it from the poems and because based off of Google, her parents are alive, so it will be her grandma. And those poems are not particularly bad. Again, it's the same thing. I'm not gonna read all the poems because it's like 200 something pages, but they're okay. They're better than the opening one. But what made me kind of uncomfortable is that she mixed up the poems about her grandma and put like a sex poem in the middle and then went back talking about her grandma. And that made me uncomfortable. This is the poem that I'm talking about. I seem to be your new favorite novel, one that keeps you up at night, turning my pages, fingers lingering on me so you don't lose your place. This poem is actually good. It's actually better than the one I've read before and I liked it and I would probably repost it. <laughs> um, but it's just uncomfortable that she's placed it like right in the middle of two different groups of poems about a dead family member. And it made me think, how did she organize this book? Because there are no chapters. So the, the Rupi Core books, they have chapters and themes and I feel like that is a good organization technique is to, you know, put all the love poems together, put all the family ones together, put all the ones about mental health together and so on and so forth and then decide on the order so that it makes sense, so that it is more of a story. If you want it to be a descent into madness type thing, into like mental health issues, you put the happy ones first and then you get to the sad ones right at the end. If you want the viewer to feel happy and satisfied at the end, you do it as a crescendo. Like this is 
a better way to organize it. I feel like she kind of wrote them and published them in the order that she thought about writing them, which is not good because it's very, very chaotic. It's very like all over the place. And I did not like that. After writing the poems about her grandma, she writes a poem about her dead dog, which is one of the better ones because I've experienced what she's experienced. I had a dog that unfortunately passed away. Well, we had to put him down because he had cancer. And the thing is, with this poem, it's so easy to figure out that it's about a dog without even knowing her dog's name. And that is what I liked. I like that the reader can easily tell what this is about. And it is relatable like she wants it. But it's not too in your face. Like it doesn't explicitly say it's a dog. My Delilah. I remember her on our porch. How she closed her eyes in the sun as I held her close to me. I can hear the wind chimes from a summer afternoon. I was always clinging to her, trying to save our quiet moments. She knew I loved her without ever learning my words. And she loved me right back. Without ever learning my words, this bit so easily conveys that it's about a pet. Because up to then, you could kind of feel like it was about two people, two women in a relationship. I think she's bisexual, so that could be a thought that you'd have. But then seeing that part makes it all come together and makes you as a reader realize what it's about. And I like poetry to be about that. I like poetry to be a journey, an exploration, if you want. I like that about it. It was one of my favorites. Next up, there are a lot of love poems, some good, some bad. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I want you in every shade that you come in, all the good and all the bad. This is like a really bad poem, this is a tweet. So I wanna mix up the good and the bad ones because it's <laughs> a lot of both of them, to be honest. It's a weird mix. I feel like this book should have been maybe shorter, should have been Without all the white pages and without the, some of the poems, it would have been maybe a... I don't know, if you did an illustration for every single poem, it would have been half of the size that it is, but it would have been a lot better and it would have conveyed the essence of what she wanted in just a better way, in my opinion. But here's a good one. You pointed out the Big Dipper to me on the balcony near the end of summer, but I let myself forget so you can show me again. Just tell me more about the stars, my love. Allow me to lose myself in your constellations. This is good because this is a simple image, but it's relatable. It's when you love someone or when you really, really care about someone, you want to hear everything they have to say and you want to relieve your first moments when you still felt very nervous about it, when you felt uncertain, but when you were getting to know each other because if you're in a stable relationship for a long time, it's very, very hard to learn new things about the other person. So it's the mutual exploration that is the most fascinating part of a relationship and I relate to that and I understand what she was trying to do here. Here's another bad one. We're gonna mix probably 50-50 out here. Um, you let me lay on your clean sheets and wrap myself in your damp duvet. The tumbling washing machine mixed with the sound of your video games. Like, what's the point of this? He's playing video games and you're in his bed. That's just, that's an image, that's not a poem. That's like a two second visual. It didn't really add anything to it, to their relationship. I assume some of it is about Cole, but it just didn't do anything. He laid down his pen after a few quiet moments and there were no marks on the corner of the page where his hand had been resting. The ink had run dry. There was nothing, nothing left. This is a good poem about how two people kind of stay together but they start falling apart and moving farther away from each other throughout the relationship and I don't know if this is about Cole, like I said I assume it is but it's quite sad when the distance starts forming between you when you're still a couple I like this poem because the metaphors of her being a writer as she well she is a writer now she's published something her being a writer and she's seeing him as an author and it also kind of conveys that they're both the authors of their story, of their relationship, because that's a two people game. And this is like another one that is quite simple, but I quite liked it. How is it possible that the moment your breath meets mine, my lungs become so clear, it's as if I have been silently suffocating. It is a play on the um, very, very popular belief that if you find your soulmate, you'll feel no anxiety, no stress, you will feel content because 
a soulmate is not meant to stress you out it's meant to give you peace and i like that this is like a i think buddhist or hinduist view i don't remember but it's like an eastern view of what um a soulmate is compared to the european view which is more of butterflies in your stomach and stuff but asian people think that it's just inner peace and it feels comfortable it feels at home because you know you're meant to be with that person so the stress is all gone and i like that view more than our view culturally this is another one that i don't understand the point of having it in a book i wish i would have kissed you harder before i left this morning again this is like a tumblr post or tweet it's not a poem how can it be love if you don't fear the loss of them it's the same thing this is this is not a poem <laughs> when you told me i had won your heart i didn't expect that i would have to share your body with anyone else you were mine and yet you were everyone else's and for this this is another one like the same with the dog poem that i liked because it makes you think of something else at the start and then by the end of it you realize that the meaning is not what you thought it was so the sharing your body with anyone else part makes you feel like the person cheated but then you are mine and yet you are everyone else's it's about dating someone who's a public figure because they more or less belong to the fans so they'll never be truly yours and that's the distinction between anyone else and everyone else that was made very very clear and i liked it and that's why I said I think it's about coal, you know? This is a really good one as well. But there is one thing that I don't like about this kind of poem. It's the way that she puts the spaces between the lines sometimes seems pointless and random just to make it longer. Like, a space should indicate a pause and sometimes it just doesn't. Apologies are a band-aid. The wound is still there underneath. It still hurts. It just looks cleaner on the outside. If I apologize, would you be cured? Or is that just a way of hiding the ugliness of truth? The hurt says my sorry will never heal the way you want it to. So you might as well learn to heal yourself without waiting for anyone else to do it. I like this because it just says don't depend on others for your happiness. Depend on yourself. Trust yourself. I like this. It's the layout that I don't like. But the words, they're fine in this one. I keep reminding myself that we are not feeling the same things you said for yourself I'm more invested than you are, you're not experiencing this rejection. Sitting with one leg crossed over the other, smoking cigarettes and turning from me as you exhale, shifting your attention away, I'm sitting miles from you it seems. Memorizing the curl of smoke escaping your lips. Feeling the loss of you, the strain in my chest when you forget I'm even here. And that's what hurts the most, feeling this alone. Mutual heartbreak would be the only comforting option, but you can't seem to spare me that. I like this as well, because it expresses a feeling of just being heartbroken in front of a person who does not care about you, and that is relatable. Like, I hate to keep using this word, but that's what she wanted, isn't it? So, it is relatable, and it's good. It's written very well. You can clearly see the visual of two people who are next to each other, yet one of them is not there mentally and emotionally. Like you can see it in your head and that makes for good poetry, if you can picture it. And your lonely sober mind will always come back to me when the pillow next to you is vacant and you've exhausted all of your distractions, but keep running. And I like this one because the last line makes it so different from the rest of it. So the tone of it at the start is kind of sad, melancholic, but then keep running is like she's more aggressive in her approach to that person she seems sad at first but then the sadness turns to anger and I think it's like a good transition because it's very very abrupt and it's very very brief so I do like that one I think you might be the death of me it's as if I'm running at full speed towards my grave I like this because it associates emotional death with general reckless behavior that can lead to physical death the driving at full speed for example could be an image here and I also like, I forgot to mention this, I also like the fact that the illustrations from the poems following up this poem that um, you can see on the page, like you can see the illustration on the back because the page is kind of transparent. So because of that, the illustration works as an illustration for the previous poem as well as the poem that it's next to. So I kind of like that. I don't know if that was intentional or it's just the pages are bad, but I do feel like it might have been intentional because it makes sense. Our bodies have the ability to adapt and live on. Sometimes it's as if we are walking around with a broken bone, refusing to let it be put back in place. And we can withstand the pain. 
To secure protection, the heart forms a barricade, a double-edged sword, often puncturing itself more than it, it the enemies it's supposed to keep out puncturing me. I like this because it's something I do, unfortunately. Um, you put up your defenses after somebody hurts you and it hurts you too to do that, to distance yourself from people, it hurts you because it makes you forget why it's like to feel real emotion and connection to people because you can never trust anyone. And I do like the visuals of that, a sword that is there to defend you but it also hurts you. Or it could not necessarily even be double-edged, it could just be a normal sword that you, you grab it and you hold on to it to defend yourself but the um, part that you're holding on to is the sharp part so your hand is bleeding but you continue to hold it that would have been a good image as well I think as an alternative I'm not saying that would be better or no this deep and droning falls to love him wasn't a choice it was a need that led me to pursue this beautiful but broken person this emotionally unavailable human being whose heart was so wrapped up in fear fear of being vulnerable and exposed fear of feeding the aches that was already growing this poem is not good or bad but I just wanted to outline what I was saying before about the layout. This layout is dreadful. These are not supposed to be poses. These are just like random times when she hit enter, when she edited this. Like, it, it, I don't like it. It's unnecessary. It's ex it just, it's, it's very extra. <laughs> and the excess of doing that, like if you do it too much, it's excessive and it's, it gets to a point where the reader doesn't want to see it and it doesn't make an impact. If you only do it when you actually need to create the idea of a pause, then the reader is actually gonna pause when they read the book. But if you do it all the time, then it will just become a normal thing and the reader is not gonna look at it and think, oh yeah, I have to pause now. They're just gonna read it as normal. So it just makes no impact anymore. It's just like an artistic choice for the point of what, like a cool, Layout for a graphic designer. You're an author, you're not a graphic designer. <laughs> Don't save me from whatever universe this is that allows me to be on the receiving end of your lips. This is good because together with the other poems, it expresses the fact that the relationship was mutually abusive or toxic or whatever you want to call it, but she still doesn't want to be saved by people outside of the relationship because the good always the bad in her view. So I did like the um, idea of this, even though it's quite basic. The silence between my questions and your inability to answer them is deafening and the pillow you put between us before you fall asleep doesn't go unnoticed. As if there wasn't enough of a divide, this should do the trick. This is the same as the one poem that I was thinking about when um, I think he was like smoking and she felt the distance between them. This is good because it really conveys the way that relationships can be so good one day and then slowly crumble and fall apart and you can feel it but you haven't actually left the person and it makes you upset that you know you're still in that situation and you don't want to lose them but you don't want to continue it like this so you're in this like limbo you're stuck on what should i do should i leave or should i stay there were some longer poems that i'm not gonna read because i think they're like a couple pages long all of them but i wanted to describe them because i feel like her long poems that are more than one page actually are a lot better than her short poems but again, they're too long to read and to dissect here, so I'm gonna say one of them is a poem that describes anxiety in a way that you feel like you, the person who's the anxious one, is in a game of sims. So it's the whole, you know, walking around the house, but you forget what you're supposed to do. You're waiting for a command from a higher being, but you don't receive it. So I liked that because it can be like that when you feel like you're anxious or depressed, you can feel like you don't know what you're doing, you're just like sleepwalking. Another poem was about being an original and just not finding the new words to create a poem, which is unfortunately a fear that all of us artists have nowadays because we always feel like everything was already created and we don't want to start doing something because we know that it's not going to be entirely ours. And it's sad because if you compare it to the beginning, so for example, cinema. Classical cinema will never be comparable to modern cinema because modern cinema always has some elements that are not new to people. So back in the day when they made the first suspense films or horror films, people didn't know what they were getting themselves into. So the audience was shocked. But nowadays you go to the cinema for the purpose of seeing a horror film and you know what to expect. So it's not the same impact 
emotionally on the viewer and I can understand why she feels like her book is not original it's just like all the like Rupi Kaur wannabe books and I get that but at the same time I think for her fans this is a good present and the people who care about her will like it. And then there was like a really good poem, again like a really long one, so I'm not gonna read it, about how little time we have and how we keep focusing on our future instead of realizing that, you know, you cannot say to somebody I love you forever because you don't know what forever is gonna be, but you should love them now in the present instead of just trying to live in the future. And I did like that because that, again, as somebody who has anxiety, she understands that people like us, because I have anxiety too, we are so focused on what is gonna happen in the future that we forget to live in the present. And it's just like a good lesson that I feel like I need to think about this more often, you know? Like it made me feel like, yeah, this is something I need to work on personally. And this is like a bad poem. Uh, I put it in here because I just want you guys to see it and tell me if I'm just crazy or it's really bad. Graffiti. Another way that humans can say I beat you, like dogs marking their territory with so much undiscovered earth and space. How do we all end up flocking to the same places? Like, I don't understand what the point was of this. Like, what did she want to say? I literally did not understand. This is like the only one that I didn't get in the whole book because it just doesn't make any sense. Nothing is more interesting than whatever is outside the window when we're alone in this car. Silence. The space between words is endless and your eyes seem to connect with everything except for me. The same as the other points about distance. This conveys a crumbling foundation of a relationship, which is probably what happened to her in real life. I would say this is her experience because she keeps coming back to this theme. This is what I don't like about the book because it's not in a, an order. This feels random and out of place. If I could have discussed these poems together, this would have made more sense, but I'm just discussing them in the order that they're in. I think we're scared to say it's that maybe you and I just want different things, that we are two fundamentally different people. We can't fit into the boxes that we have drawn for each other and neither one of us is willing to bend. I like this because it has a visual of two people with maybe lying down on the ground and there are boxes made out of chalk and you could like, or salt maybe even, and you could like kick it out and remove yourself from that or change the shape of the box, but you don't want to because that is what happens when you fall in love with somebody who is famous. If you fall in love with somebody who's famous, even if you're famous too, you have a pre formed opinion on that person based off of what you see from them in public, like interviews and like other things like that. But you actually don't know them. This is a mutually parasocial relationship between two celebrities. So it makes sense that they've created expectations for each other before even being together. And it makes sense that none of them are willing to admit that. And it's sad because sometimes love and compatibility are not both together within the same relationship. Because you can love someone and be fundamentally different people, like she says. And I don't know, I like that because it gives me a new perspective on her and her relationship, of like her as a personal celebrity. And now we can get to my favorite one. A sense of longing becomes overwhelmingly present when I am surrounded by all of these people. Have I always been unhappy or is it just now? All of a sudden, as if I should have seen it before. And I'm wondering why I didn't recognize the long line of unease. A string that's been there all along underneath, finally becoming untangled. I am gonna be biased when I say this. This is my favorite poem from the book because it feels like I wrote it. Because I felt this so many times. I've been depressed since, probably since I can't remember myself. And that is really bad because you just forget what it's like to be happy because you wonder, was I just born this way? Is this just who I'm always gonna be? And I do like the emotion behind it. It just feels very, very open from her, you know, emotionally, to share this with us. She's um, a very, very open person when it comes to mental health, and I think in the book, at the end, she describes herself as actor and mental health advocate, which I'm happy that this exists, because I know that public scrutiny is a big thing when you are somebody who's struggling mentally. I'm happy that she's coming forward with this story and opening up to people, because she can actually inspire people who watch Riverdale, because she's targeting a young audience who 
is not probably fully happy with the fact that they have mental health issues i'm not gonna say happy maybe just like fully acceptant of that reality so i think she's helping them to come to terms with it and that's a really good thing for her with our backs facing towards each other she could almost pass for you i keep thinking that she is the tossing under the sheet sounds the same in the dark i can't see who's moving anymore me or her all i know is it's not you and she will never be i don't want to say that this is problematic but it is because it's enforcing the stereotype that bisexual girls are just straight girls who sometimes mess around with other girls because she as a woman will never be you as a man because it's a man that's being described throughout all this book and i don't know if that was her intention or if her intention was just platonic as in like a friend having a sleepover with her makes her feel like she's not alone in a bed but it's not the same as her ex-boyfriend I don't know if that is her intention or if her intention was a romantic relationship between her and the girl not being able to replace her ex-boyfriend but I feel like it plays into a harmful stereotype about bisexuals which I know it's not intentional on her side but I hope you guys can see why this is a dangerous line to toe in People wish for me to be this trailblazing girl the one who has marked out a path for others to follow on how to be happy, how to fight when your limbs feel broken. Sometimes I feel like a fraud, but then again, I never said I was happy. I've never advertised a cure. I've only told the world what I feel, not how to overcome. It feels fraudulent to be given a pat on the back for simply telling the truth. And this is the point I'm gonna end this discussion on. I like it. And as I said, I'm happy that teenage girls have somebody to look up to like her, because I never did. Well, I looked up to people like Linkin Park growing up and what happened with Linkin Park obviously broke my heart because that is somebody who's prevented my suicide and now he's dead. But I've never actually had a woman advocate for mental health at the time when I was a teenager. And I feel like she's a good role model, even though some of the poems are objectively not good. I do still feel like it does not make this book less useful and less valuable for the people who actually need to read this and it's actually been pretty entertaining like i said and it's been helpful because i'm going through a rough time with 2020 and just everything is upsetting so i do feel like this book for me even though i do have some criticism of it has served its purpose when i read it and i would probably go back to it once in a while and yeah if you like this video please give it a thumbs up subscribe if you want to see more commentary and lifestyle videos i might do more literature related videos to be honest and comment down below what you thought about this book if you've read it what you think about lily what you think about riverdale is it a train wreck or is it just me <laughs> um and i'll see you guys next time bye